Do you remember what you thought of uh, when the Christmas season began? When you first started, uh, maybe a month or so ago or a few weeks ago, you started thinking about Christmas. What did you think? Uh, my favorite memories are uh, Christmases with Nancy's mom and dad. Uh, fire in the fireplace, the Christmas tree decorated, loads of presents for Michael and Melinda. Nancy and I got one or two, but the kids got most of them. Uh, going to church for the Christmas season. I think most people think of Christmas trees and lights and sending Christmas cards and Christmas shopping and meeting with family and friends, giving gifts, children getting gifts, right? They don't think much of giving gifts, but they're sure ready to receive them. And don't worry, kids, I was one once, even though you probably find that hard to believe. Uh, and I couldn't wait. Uh, for some, Christmas is a difficult time. Remember old man Marley, Kevin McAllister's uh, neighbor across the street? I'm talking about home alone. Does that ring any bells? All right. And remember, he was estranged from his son and his daughter-in-law and his granddaughter, and uh, it was a very sad time for him. And, and we all recognize that you know, there are some times where Christmas isn't as joyous uh, for some people. And, um, and then there's the world. Santa Claus and red-nosed reindeers and hippopotamuses. Grandma's run over by a reindeer. <laughs> um, Frosty the snowman, and, and the one I really don't get is the Grinch. I mean, I've never seen any of those, but I, what that has to do with, I guess he stole something, and it was Christmas. Yeah, thank you. You know, I started thinking about what did the Apostle Paul think about Christmas? Brother Eric, I'm going to answer your question, okay? Um, what did he think about Christmas? Now, I know those of you who are theologians know that the Apostle Paul did not know the word Christmas, okay? I will give you that. He didn't know that word. Uh, if he would have heard it, he never would have liked it, I guarantee you. The word Christmas was first found in Latin in Christus Mace in 1038 AD, and it meant the Mass of Christ or Christ's Mass. But even though Paul didn't know the word Christmas, he certainly understood the thought and idea of Christmas. He certainly knew of the birth, the miraculous uh, virgin conception of the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew of the incarnation and the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, I'd like to share with you Paul's perspective on Christmas. And the passage that I had picked about two months ago was in the book of Philippians. Because in that book, as Paul thought about Christmas, he thought about how it was the saints would get along with each other. Did you know that? Because Paul wrote these words in Philippians. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Isn't that amazing? Paul's thought of Christmas was on humility and how everyone in the church ought to have that attitude of Christ and get along with each other. That's not a normal Christmas thought, is it? But that was Paul's. But Pastor Jonathan announced about a month after I was picking out that passage that he's going to start preaching on the book of Philippians, so I'm going to leave that to him. He can deal with that passage in Philippians chapter 2. Paul also reflects on the wonder of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ when he wrote to the Galatian church. Remember these words, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. When Paul thought of Christmas, he thought of redemption. 
the payment of a price for our sins to set us free. An adoption where we would be adopted into the family of God as sons to receive an ultimate inheritance. Again, those are not normal Christmas thoughts, but it tells you what a spiritual mind is focusing on when they think about Christmas. I want you to turn to Paul's first letter to Timothy, if you're not already there, and ponder this morning what Paul wrote to his young son in the faith, Timothy, about Christmas. Andrew already read the verse. It's verse 15 of chapter 1. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. For Paul, Christmas was about saving sinners. That was his thought. That's what came into his mind. It was not Santa Claus, it was Savior Christ. It wasn't a Christmas tree, it was Calvary's tree. It wasn't twinkling lights, it was the light of the world. And it wasn't a red-nosed reindeer, but the red blood of a Redeemer that Paul had on his heart and mind as he thought about Christmas. And the question is, what in the world caused Paul to write to Timothy and even mention Christmas here? Remember when you study the scriptures, the three rules of hermeneutics, the first three rules are, what are they? Context, context, context. Why did Paul feel a necessity to bring up Christmas, okay, the birth of Christ and his coming into the world to Timothy? Well, Paul had been in prison in Rome, and Dr. Luke kind of left us in suspense at the end of the book of Acts because he leaves Paul in prison. And he's in his own rented quarters, and he's preaching the gospel. And, and of course, we all wonder, what in the world happened to Paul? Well, if you read the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus, it appears that Paul was released from prison just like he had expected. When he wrote the prison epistles, he said he expected to be re released, and we believe he was. And after he was released from prison, remember, he wanted to go to Spain, but it seems like he went and found Timothy, and he and Timothy went to Ephesus. And Paul went back to that church that he had spent three and a half years there, started a practorium, trained men so that from that city, all of the uh, Asia Minor had heard the gospel because of the men that he had trained and had sent out. And Paul left Timothy there in Ephesus and headed off to Macedonia. And when he got there, he wrote a letter back to Timothy, which is our letter of 1 Timothy. He also wrote to Titus, who was on the island of Crete, and he was also uh, shepherding a flock there. Um, it seems very clearly that Paul was rearrested during the time of Nero, about 64 AD, and that he was martyred during that time. And it was while he was in prison at that second imprisonment in Rome that he wrote 2 Timothy and talked about not being released, but ending up uh, receiving glory because of his ministry. Now, I don't know if you know a lot about the pastoral epistles. They're very important. They show a different side of Paul than all the other epistles. They talk a lot about his personal relationship with Timothy and Titus and others other intimate friends and associates. And as the last of his letters to be written, they inform of us of his later years of, mi of ministry. And they also have a wealth of other information. And I would encourage you to read the whole book here, this whole letter. Paul says, the purpose in writing 1 Timothy was this, that you might know how to conduct yourself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Isn't that interesting? This whole book was written by Paul to Timothy so that we might know how to act in church together. Probably pretty important, right? Since we gathered together a couple times a week. Besides a wealth of all the practical information in these epistles, they also teach some very important doctrinal truths about the scriptures, about salvation, about the Savior, and especially Paul's hope in his Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance 
that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all, is really a digression. Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says to Timothy, stay there and make sure these false teachers who were teaching falsely about the law and how somehow if you kept the law, you could be saved. There are churches 2,000 years later that are still teaching that today, and it's heresy. And Paul says, Timothy, you stay there in Ephesus and you teach these guys. Don't teach those things. And as Paul thought about the law, he recognized all it would do would be what? Did you listen carefully? It can just condemn you because it, it reveals to you that you're a sinner. And when Paul thought about his, the uh, revelation of the law about being a sinner, he thought of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and how it had saved him. And that's why he writes this verse because he himself had been saved by that glorious gospel that had been proclaimed. And so the Apostle Paul emphasizes three truths about the real meaning of Christmas that we ought to tuck deep in our hearts this morning so that each person here might experience the true blessings of Christmas. So what are these three truths? Well, they're very simple. They're found in this verse. The first one is to know the real meaning of Christmas is crucial. All right, there's just a simple word, the word crucial. What does that mean if it's crucial? Extremely important, absolutely essential. And that's how Paul starts out. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. Or maybe your translation says faithful is the saying. And that's really a better translation, for it indicates that what Paul is going to go on to say was a saying that was shared around the church very often. And that is, why did Christ Jesus come? He came into the world to save sinners. It was a very well-known statement. Paul says it's a trustworthy statement. Ten times in this epistle, Paul will say that. It's trustworthy, something that he wrote. Full reliance. And the statement was this accepted saying among the brethren. It was trustworthy. Uh, when I came back from uh, visiting Rick and Marty in the hospital, I stopped at, in Lucky at the fuel mart there. And it's usually the cheapest uh, fuel around on the way back from Toledo. And so I was filling up. And of course, all the new technology today, they have television sets in gas pumps. Wow. And uh, there was a commercial on for Valvoline. I mean, it just immediately I went and it came on and it was a commercial for Val Valvoline. And the announcer asked this question. Can you imagine this? I'm preparing this sermon. Here's the question that the, the guy for Valvoline said, who do you trust to change your oil? Now for me, that's a good question because a few years ago when I first moved here, I went to one of the car dealerships. I'm not gonna mention them. You'll have to ask me ask afterwards. And they left the uh, plug out of my oil when they changed my oil, and it all ran out before I got home. So I took it back and I told them, hey, all my oil, oh, that's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll replace your oil. Well, the guy who replaced my oil uh, cross-threaded the plug and it all ran out again. This is a true story, I'm not making this up. I went back the third time and they said, well, we can't give you a free oil change the third time, you're gonna have to pay for it. I've never been back there again. Who do you trust? Paul says, this is what you can trust. And we are living in a time when it's hard to trust anyone or anything. Is that true? I mean, you know, you hear something on the television or on the radio or in social media and you wonder, is this really true? And what do we find out? It's not true. In fact, you can hear people saying it so long and so hard, you're absolutely convinced it's true. And then they show the videos and you actually watch it yourself and you find out that wasn't true at all. And Paul says, what I'm going to tell you here is trustworthy. No spin, no revision, no lying, no deception. The Word of God is what Paul is giving us, the Bible. And so I would ask you the question, who do you trust with your soul? That's what Paul is getting to here. It's crucial to understand what Paul is saying here. This formula clearly marks the saying as an article of belief 
worthy of acceptance and deeply cherished by all believers. And I asked myself, Paul, why would you say that this is trustworthy if every word of God is flawless? I mean, if, if, the whole, if every word in the Bible is true and trustworthy, why would he say this? Because it is so important. Do you understand that? It is so critical to your eternal destiny that Paul says this is a trustworthy statement. And he goes on, deserving full acceptance. The ESV and the New King James, I'm going to have the ESV. And the New King James, anybody using the King James New King? Yeah, it has a it has a connection word there, the little word and. Do you see that? New American Standard does not have that. It's, it's in the original text. And I asked myself, you know, why is that important, Paul? Why did you add the word and? Well, because it's not enough just to know that it's trustworthy. What do you have to do? You've got to accept it and make it your own. It isn't just enough to say, and listen, that's how I was for 25 years. I was raised a Roman Catholic. There was never a question in my mind that Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sins of the world, that he was buried, that he rose again. I believed in the Trinity. I knew the Bible was true, but I had never accepted it for myself. That's what the and means. It's not enough just to know it. It means you have to fully accept it. And that's what Paul is talking about. It's crucial. Give it a favorable reception, Paul is saying, this statement that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Don't ignore this. Don't procrastinate. Appreciate it. Accept it, Paul is saying. It, saying. Count on it. It's good as gold. We would say it's money in the bank, right? Everyone should accept this statement as true. That little word deserving is interesting in Greek. Think of a scale, and it has that bar on it, right, that goes up and down the bar. Okay, that's the Greek word for deserving. Worthy in some of your translations. It was a marketplace term, deserving, worthy. And what it meant was is that the scale was tipped on this down here, but when you put something on this side, it tipped the scale the other way. What a fascinating word for Paul to use about accepting what the Bible says. It means to tip the scales, to weigh the sayings out. It's crucial. When you stop and weigh this truth that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, with everything else in the world, it tips the scales that Christ is the one who's most important. Why? Because it's your eternal destiny that's on the balance scale and mine. You remember when Jesus was speaking to Peter and his disciples? It was after Peter was encouraging not to go to the cross, and Jesus said something really mean to Peter. What did he say to him? Get behind me, Satan. You mean Jesus said things like that? Yes. And you remember, and I want you to turn there in Matthew chapter 16. Just turn in Matthew chapter 16. Because I want you to read what Jesus said. Matthew 16, verse 26. Matthew 16, verse 26. What did Jesus say to Peter and the other apostles? I like to hear those pages turning. When Nancy and I were traveling this summer, or past summer, and we stopped at a... At a, a Baptist Church, the, as the people were turning the pages, the pastor said, now you know that's Baptist air conditioning. Here, it's really a question. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Paul's got that balance beam, and here's the world. Boy, it's really everything in the world, how weighty that is. All the, all the pleasure and all the uh, materialism and everything that you can have, you know, and, it, and the scale's way down here. And then Paul says, but wait a minute. Here is the statement that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and it just tips that scale this way. It's a heavy staying. It's weighty. 
And the question is, how will you answer the question? Which will you choose? The world and all it offers and lose your soul? An eternity separated from God in hell? Or to repent of your sins and trust Jesus as your Savior, Savior and follow Him and have eternal life? You remember what Jesus said? Many choose that broad road, don't they? Which will you choose? Teenagers and young adults, I want to tell you something. This choice is either coming up for you or already has. And you're going to have to make a decision. You can have the whole world. And the devil will give it to you. He'll be happy to give it to you. How do we know that? How do we know he'd be happy to give you the whole world and everything in it? Because he offered it to Jesus. Remember that? The devil came to Jesus and he offered to give Jesus everything if he would worship Satan. And you have the same choice. Children, you need to think that through very carefully. Young people, you need to think that through very carefully. The world will offer you everything. But Paul says, the scales tip in the favor of choosing Jesus. To understand the true meaning of Christmas is crucial for everyone. But Paul goes on to say the second truth Paul says to know the real meaning of Christmas is also beneficial for everyone. Not just crucial, but beneficial for everyone. Listen to what he says. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. That means everybody should accept it completely. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Saving sinners. That's what Paul thinks about when he thinks about Christmas. And who is it that saves sinners? Pastor Jonathan... Thank you for the masterful job last Sunday morning of explaining to us about Christ. The anointed one. Christos in Greek, Mashiach in Hebrew, Christ in English. All of them mean the anointed one. And Pastor Jonathan shared with us about you anoint prophets, priests, and kings. And Jesus was all three. And so you know what Christ means. And that, that title puts emphasis on his ministry. Remember, David was anointed by Samuel to be king. Prophets, priests, and kings. And, and Jesus was all of these. And the Messiah in the Old Testament is the anointed one. And then there's Jesus. That's his human name. The name the angel gave to Joseph. And it means what? Yahweh saves or the Lord saves. I was thinking about um, when Jesus was a little boy and he must have been running around. His mom would say, Jesus Jesus, where are you? I'm here, Mom. He never ran away from her. He was perfect. Well, how would you like to be the other five siblings in that family? You have a perfect brother. Amazing. Jesus. Every time she called out his name, what was she saying? The Lord saves. The Lord saves. I have a grandson named Joshua. You know what his name means? The Lord saves because Joshua is the Hebrew equivalent of Jesus in Greek. Joshua, every time you hear the name, the Lord saves. That's the message. Jesus. Oh, how I love to read that. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph... Before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, Yeshua, Hoshea, Joshua, Deliverer, Savior. And how did Jesus save the world? How did he do it? How would he save sinners? Well, look at what Paul says. How is it beneficial to everyone. He came into the world to save sinners. Just like God said he would, by the way. Thousands of years ago in the Garden of Eden, the promise came to Adam and Eve, what? 
that there would be one who would come and crush the head of the serpent. And to Abraham, God made a promise that he would come a redeemer. To David, 3,000 years ago, there's coming a redeemer. And you know, Isaiah, we hear it in the Hallelujah chorus now as Christmas time comes and Isaiah 9, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. Over and over again, God says, he's coming. And guess what? He came. Because every time God says something's going to happen, it happens. No one can thwart his hand. No one can stop him. His plans are carried out absolutely every time. Everybody say amen to that. Because if he's promised you eternal life, that's pretty important. That you're going to have it. And just like God said he would come over and over and over again, he came. That's what Paul says. Into history. Into the world. The incarnation of Christ. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The son of God, the second person of the Trinity, became a human being with a human body and a human nature. 100% God, 100% man. He came just as God promised, because God is always faithful to do all that he promises. And that is an undeniable historical reality that Jesus came. Now, there's a lot of argument about who he was and what he did, but no one in their right mind would deny that Jesus Christ came here 2,000 years ago. And so that begs the question, if he came, it, what it means when he says he came into the world, I was really pondering this, the preposition there, into the world. It doesn't say he came to the world. It doesn't say he came in the world. It says he came into the world. And when Paul uses the word, word world, he's not talking about our cosmos, our, our globe, okay, the earth. He's talking about the world of sinful men. Over and over again, just look up the word world in your uh, concordance and look at what Paul wrote in his epistles and you'll see how Paul used that word. He used it of the realm of men. And Jesus Christ, when he came into the world, he became one of us, but without sin. The Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, became a human being just like us without sin. What a thought. How can you ponder all that it means? His condescension, his incarnation are beyond our understanding. And yet, 4,000 years ago, Job was crying out for this very thing to happen. Do you remember that? Job, in the midst of all of his sorrow, in the midst of all of his suffering, and the death of his children, and his wife forsaking the Lord and saying, why don't you forsake God? Job cried out and he says, listen, I wish there was a mediator. Could there be anybody who could put their hand on me and their hand on God and settle why I'm in this misery? Could anybody save me? And the apostle Paul answers 2,000 years ago, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all the testimony born at the proper time. Yes, there is a mediator. Yes, there's someone. He came into the world. Let me ask you a question. Would you leave heaven to come here? Would you? I'll help you answer that question, okay? Have you left your home and walked across the street to your neighbor and told them about Jesus? Because I guarantee you, if you won't do that, you're not going to leave heaven and come here. How sad. He came all the way down here to this God-forsaken, sinful, wicked world and became one of us to save us. And what are we doing? The church, we're comfortable. We're rich. We have everything, and we can't even walk across the street to tell our neighbor. We're too afraid to talk to the person at the store. Oh, how I love Pastor John. Um, when we uh, went up to the Getty concert the other night, he 
engaged the hostess at uh, Outback. And uh, he was talking to her and started talking to her about the Lord. And, and uh, I kind of walked into the middle of the conversation. And uh, as we were talking with her, I, I, she had a really interesting name. I'd never heard it before. And I wish I could remember it, but I do remember what she said. Well, it's an, it's an Indi- a native Indian, American Indian word that means butterfly. And I said, well, we're going down to the church down here, to the Baptist church down here to go to the Getty concert. And she goes, oh, I go to a Baptist church. And I said, you do? She goes, yeah, but it's not that one. It's Bethany Baptist Church. And I said, well, how long have you been going there? She goes, one month. And I said, well, how did you end up going to that church? She goes, well, she goes, you know, my boyfriend, he took me over to meet his parents. And his parents are really religious. And they asked me to go to church. And she goes, I went to that Baptist church with them, and that pastor was preaching about Jesus. And she said, and I got saved. <laughs> and, and she'd just been saved a month. And I thought to myself, wow, you know, just, we just need to talk to people, engage them, talk to them about Jesus. If Jesus was willing to come all the way down here to this wicked world, shouldn't we be willing to go to our own neighbors? It certainly was beneficial to us that Jesus came. Would you agree with that? Don't you think you ought to share that benefit with others? What benefit did he give us? Well, to save sinners is what Paul says, to save sinners. In the Greek text, it says sinners to save, which means sinners are, it, that's the problem. That's the issue. The emphatic position of the word sinner tells us that Paul's thought was we're sinners and that's a problem. Those who have missed the mark, those who have fallen short of the glory of God and His holiness, sinful, guilty. Who are those people? There is none righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is no one who does good. There is not even one. Now, if you have low self-esteem, please don't listen to the rest of this, okay? Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues, they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes, and that is the description of man by God himself. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil. And and children, you're probably sitting here and saying, I don't even know what most of those words mean. All right, the next one's for you, okay? You ready? Here it comes. This is in this whole list of all these wicked things. Disobedient to parents. How serious is it to God to disobey your parents? It's right in the list of all these other things with murderers and liars. We don't understand how wicked we are, do we? How sinful we are without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Paul wrote this to the church in Galatia, to the church, the saints. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. And then comes that horrible end to that verse. Of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You're lost. You're a sinner. You're on your way to hell. There's no hope. And this describes all of us. 
And in Paul, when he wrote his last letter, he could see how wicked the world was, just like we're seeing our world. And he says, listen, realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. And here's his list, his last list of sinners, lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. You'd almost think he was looking at America and writing about us. And he wrote this 2,000 years ago. The greatest catastrophe in the history of the earth was when Adam sinned in the garden. And it plunged us all into sin and the penalty for sin, which is death, physical and spiritual death. And I know every one of us know how sinful we really are. No matter how we hide it, no matter how we present ourselves, when we're by ourselves, we know our own sinfulness. Just like David, be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me. He knew he had sinned against God, right? Adultery, murder. Wow, we're, we're in trouble. If you're a sinner, you're in trouble. You're in, you're in the worst trouble you could ever be in. You're lost and hopeless and helpless. And like Paul said to the uh, church in Ephesus, uh, to the Gentiles, you're without hope and without God in the world. That's a bad place to be in. But praise God, the, the benefit, listen, the benefit to sinners that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's a great word, isn't it? Save. What a word. Preserve from harm to rescue, to deliver, to bring salvation. And if you're saved, you must be what? Lost, right? Lost. Remember Jesus met Zacchaeus on the road there in, in Jericho, and Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus and put his faith and trust in Jesus, took him to his house, and Jesus said this to Zacchaeus, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost lost. What a horrible word. Under the wrath of God, hell, the second death, the lake of fire. Is it real? I mean, is it just a figment, a myth to scare people, to get them to live uh, good lives? Or Listen to what John wrote. Now remember, John saw this I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. There's not going to be any place to hide at judgment. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. Now, how is that possible? How can you be dead and you stand? Hmm, I think you have to be resurrected, wouldn't you say? And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Think of that, everything you've ever done, meticulously recorded by the infinite, omniscient God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That's where we all belong. Do you understand that? That's what we all deserve. That's what we deserve. That's where we ought to be. But Christmas, the benefit of Christmas, Jesus came to save sinners, us. The greatest catastrophe of history was when Adam sinned. But the greatest accomplishment in our, in our world was when Jesus died on the cross, it was buried and rose again from the dead so that he could give us life and free us. Do you know Jesus talked more about hell than anyone? 
Read the Gospel of Matthew. Pastor Jonathan, you covered that when you did the Sermon on the Mount. Over and over again, he talked about hell and escaping from hell. It, it, it made such an impact on Peter listening to that sermon that Peter wrote this. He said this, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, the flood, right? But preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven, uh, seven others. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and if he rescued righteous Lot in the middle of it, then God, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. Praise God. He knew that Jesus meant hell was real. And the purpose of Jesus coming to this earth was to save. Does that mean anything to you? He came to save you. That's the true theme of Christmas. That's what Christmas, Paul says, is really all about, to save. Do you remember the challenge that the scribes and the Pharisees gave to Jesus when he was hanging on the cross? Who remembers the challenge? He saved others. Let him save himself. If he's really the Son of God, let him come down from the cross, and then we'll believe. Oh, beloved, am I glad he didn't take that challenge. He could have... He could have called for all the angels in heaven to come down and destroy them all and come down off that cross. But you realize what would have happened if he did. We'd be lost forever with no hope. Christmas is beneficial. It's about saving sinners. I love what Pastor John MacArthur said about eternal security and his salvation I was listening to one of his sermons and he says, I know there has to be eternal security because I couldn't keep myself for one day. And we all know that's true. How did Jesus, Jesus save us? You ever thought about that? You heard the good news. You heard the gospel, right? You heard that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried in that tomb for three days, and he was raised according to the scriptures. And that anyone who is a sinner who is willing to repent and trust Christ as their Savior can have eternal life. Jesus said, repent. Paul said, repent. John the Baptist said, repent. And we say, I say, repent of your sins and trust Jesus. Christmas is beneficial because it saves sinners. And we all love benefits. Pastor Dave, you and I were talking uh, last week about uh, our Medicare plans, right? Oh boy, is this something else? There's plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And Dave goes, oh, I went on plan C. And I said, plan C? He goes, oh yeah, the benefits are great. They send you a card every month that you can get stuff over the counter and you get your dental. And then he, I, close your ears, Pastor. Well, you won't hear this anyway. He said, I'm ready for hearing aids, and they give $1,500 uh, for each ear each year, plus the exam, right, Pastor Dave? I mean, we're all looking for benefits all the time, right? I mean, Mike, your employees tell me it's great working for you, brother. The benefits you give them, they really appreciate. I've heard that more than once. But that's how it is, right? You get it, you're looking for benefits, like what car am I going to buy, right? Well, what does it have? I, for us, it used to be you kick the tire and, and would it run? And now it's, does it have Apple, Pl whatever Apple Play is? By the way, Pastor Dave has it in his van. He, he, um, but, you know, iPods, and I mean, that's what people today are worried about. And all I want to know is, does the tire, will the tires roll on the ground, right? And by the way, gas was 19.9 when I started driving. Nancy and I have a picture of a Sinclair station. It was, it was uh, five gallons for a dollar. And they used to get under your hood and check your oil and your water. Did they do that back in the 1800s, Tom? Okay, I wonder. Children, I know it's beneficial to obey your parents. Have you found that out, that it's beneficial, it's good for you? There's some benefits in obeying your parents. I mean... 
you know, you can buy, you not only do the gas pumps have TVs, but now the refrigerators have TVs. I mean, right? And, and, you know, do you get a Peloton or do you join Jenny Craig? Or, you know, you understand what I mean? Benefits, we're all looking for benefits all the time. What, if I take this job, what benefit will I get, you know? And, and nothing compares to the benefit you get of being saved by Jesus Christ. Nothing compares to that. If you just, if you got rid of everything else, out of the darkness into the light, your sins forgiven, the lake of fire is no longer your destination. You're no longer under the power of the evil one. Glory and honor and an inheritance in heaven are waiting for you. I mean, to go to the land of no more, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more sin, no more death, no more guilt, no more hatred. I'm ready to go. How about you? And Jesus didn't come just to save us from the penalty and the presence of sin. But beloved, listen, this is really important. He came to save us from the power of sin. Do you understand that? It's not just what he did in the past to forgive us for all of our sins or we're going to be in the land of no more. But the real issue is he has freed us from the, the very power of sin so that we can say yes to him and no to sin and let the world see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. We can say no to sin. The world can't. They're trapped. But we have the power to say no to sin because we've been saved. And so to know the true meaning, meaning of Christmas is crucial. It's essential. It's beneficial. <laughs> the benefits of knowing Christ. But to know the real meaning of Christmas, the third truth is that it must be personal. Look at what Paul says at the end of 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. I am foremost of all. There's a universal offer here in this verse. It is deserving of full acceptance, everyone everywhere. But it's also an individual acceptance among whom I am foremost of all. When Paul thought of the world of sinners, who did he think of? Himself. Who do we think of? The person next to you. The person across the street. The person who you know is worse than you are. That's who we think of. Not Paul. Paul thought of himself. And do you notice something really intriguing? He doesn't use the past tense here. He doesn't say, I was the worst of all sinners. He says, I am the worst of all sinners. I'm premier. And why? Well, just read it earlier on in the chapter, Andrew, what Andrew wrote. He was a violent aggressor. He would kill men and women. He cast their vote. We think he may have been at Stevens holding the, you know, holding the cloaks. And he was. <laughs> and Paul says, I am. And I guarantee you, if you truly come to know Christ, you feel just like Paul. Right, Alicia? We know it, don't we? We know it deep in our hearts. Do you remember these words from Jesus. This is so typical of us. I know none of you uh, husbands are like me who try to blame my wife for everything that goes wrong. But uh, you wouldn't do that. Everything that's missing, she hid it from me somewhere. I always find it in the last place I kept it. Do you remember this? Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. 
But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Now let's listen to Jesus' evaluation of those two discussions, prayers. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. In order to be saved, you have to humble yourself and acknowledge you're a sinner in need of a Savior. That you cannot save yourself. And Paul said he was the chief of sinners, the worst, the first, the leading. When he thought of all the candidates that could be picked out as the greatest of all sinners, he picked himself. He was expressing real humility and a real understanding that it was not just those people, that the saints that he was persecuting, but who? Whom was he persecuting? Jesus himself. And he found that out on the Damascus Road. And the question is, well, I want to make one more point about the text. He says, among whom I am foremost of all. Really, he says, I myself am first. And it's intriguing. It's a double emphatic in the original language. You can't see it at all in the English, but in the Greek text, when you read it, it just stands right out to you. He, you, he says, I myself. Why the translators don't translate it that way, you'd have to ask them. But I'm telling you, in the original text, Paul says, I myself. And then Paul puts the, the um, first of sinners, and at the very end of the verse, he says, I myself, which makes it doubly emphatic in the original language. Not only I myself, but he puts it at the end of the sentence. You don't usually put the subject at the end of the sentence, but he does in order to make it very clear he understood his sinfulness. Do you understand yours? Now, if he was the worst of all sinners, how in the world could a holy God ever save such a self-righteous, wicked murderer of Christians? Well, the answer is in the verses right before verse 15. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy. God did not give him what he deserved. He got mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was more than abundant. How was Paul saved? By mercy and by grace. That's how God saves every sinner. None of us deserve to be saved. He doesn't give us what we deserve, and He gives us what we don't deserve, and that is forgiveness for our sins and eternal life. Mercy and grace. You see, beloved, it's not God's love alone that saves people. He loves everybody, but the love alone can't save people. But it's His mercy and grace that allows Him to save people because of what Jesus did on the cross. Do you remember the Christmas song, Joy to the World? Do you know it begins with an invitation? You ever thought about that? Joy to the world, what? The Savior comes. What's the next line? Let earth receive her king. Yes, that's exactly right. You must receive it personally. Salvation in order to be saved. Like Saul of Tarsus had to meet Jesus personally. So you must have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. You've heard me say this over and over again. I'm going to say it again. I like saying it. And I'm preaching this morning, so I can. The Father did not send a baptistry to earth. He did not send an offering basket to earth. He did not send a diary to keep your good works in here to earth. He didn't send a church building down so you could come and sit in a church building. He sent his only unique son. And so you must trust him and trust him today. Now, the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Paul says it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. It's crucial to know the true meaning of Christmas. It's beneficial to know the true meaning of Christmas. You, have, you can have eternal life, but it's not going to be for you unless you make it personal. It has to be personal. 
it's true and trustworthy. This statement that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners is intended for everybody. He accomplished it all. And Paul says Christmas is about saving sinners. If you're here this morning and you're not certain that you have eternal life, if you're not certain that you have been saved by the Lord Jesus, do it now, right where you sit. Acknowledge you're a sinner. Admit it to him. He already knows it. You can't hide it from him. Ask him for forgiveness for your sins and the gift of eternal life and, and repent. Turn to him and say, I will follow you the rest of my life. Most of you are sitting here saying, but Pastor Keith, we already are saved. Okay, then go out this week and tell somebody, would you? This week, find somebody and tell somebody what Christmas really means.